Father, we are so grateful for the time that you've given us this morning. We're thankful for your word. We're thankful that it never goes out void, regardless of what kind of container you choose to pour it out of. It is your word, and it will accomplish what you send it to do, and we're grateful for that. Father, in this moment, we want to lift up our sisters and brothers who have been uh, kidnapped down in Haiti and taken hostage probably for some kind of ransom demand. Uh, we ask that you give them comfort. We ask that you would give them peace. Uh, we ask that you would protect them, and we ask that you would help us to obey your word in that remembering them as if we were with them. So we commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks. You can be seated. If you didn't have time to find John chapter 10, and you probably didn't, it's in the, um, it's in the New Testament, so that's the second part of your Bible. And uh, it's one of the books that has the red writing in them. So if you're not really familiar with the Bible or church is new to you and maybe you're kind of seeking out Christianity type stuff, uh, the first four books of that second part are called the Gospels. And if you've got a Bible that has red letters in it, John is the fourth one of those books. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And chapter 10, verses 1 through 10 are where we are going to be today. And we are going to be talking about the gate. Now, this is the sixth sermon, I think, in the I Am series. And so um, we've been talking about the times that Jesus uses this phrase, I am, in the Gospel of John. And uh, so I have today, I am the gate. Now, we all are familiar with different types of gates. This one right here is the kind of gate that I grew up with. It was on the left-hand side of my house. It kept our dog Chopper from running out, and we could get in and out and feed him and take care. And I also had a duck at one time. His name was Scooby Dooby Duck, and he stayed inside the fence as well. He was a big white domesticated duck, and so he couldn't fly out. So just this fence was enough to keep him in until he apparently drank some antifreeze and died. Um, true story. So this is a gate to a privacy fence. Some of y'all may have these. These are awesome for when you first put them up, right? And if you forget to winterize them every year and put that stuff on them, keeps water out, then they warp, and you have to have a truck to push it shut every time you want to close your gate. So this is like another kind of gate you may be familiar with. Some of you may live behind this gate. This is a gated community. This is where you live if you want to keep me out. So uh, this is a different kind of gate that we see different places here in Nashville. This is not Nashville because the Rocky Mountains are in the background. Uh, this is the Brandenburg Gate. This is a literal gate uh, and that used to divide East Germany from West Germany. Once the, uh, Berlin was reunified and the Germanys were reunified, this now is just like a monument uh, as a reminder of when they were divided, now it's kind of a uniter. This is where Reagan gave his famous speech that said, Mr. Gorbachev, come tear down this wall. This is the Arch of Triumph, or the Triumphal Arch, that's in France. Um, it's not really a gate, and you'd have to ask the French what it's all about. It's just there. This is the famed Black Gate of Mordor. This is the gate that stood while Aragorn, son of Arathorn, with the armies of the West, attempted to dethrone Sauron while the hobbits, Sam and Frodo, were trying to destroy the One Ring in Mount Doom. And when they accomplished that, the gate fell, and the kingdom of Sauron was no more somewhere around the end of the fourth age of Middle-earth. All right. So these are some gates just to kind of get you in mind of what we're talking about today. So the first thing that we do want to talk about in our sermon this morning is thieves, robbers, and sheep, oh my. Because Jesus launches right into this idea of there's multiple actors in this narrative that he's talking about. Now, Jesus has been talking for a while at this point when we come into chapter 10. Uh, this discourse takes place over the course of several chapters. I think it starts somewhere around chapter 7. He's come back to Jerusalem after being in Galilee and going back to Canaan and some other things. He comes back to Jerusalem and begins to talk. And in his audience, as usual, were scribes and Pharisees and religious leaders, and they were always trying to poke holes in things and always trying to figure out what he meant by this and what he meant by that. And so Jesus has been talking for a while at this point. And if you'll notice, at the end of chapter 9, right before chapter 10 starts, remember there's no chapter in diverse divisions in the original manuscripts. It was just all together. Uh, verse 40 says, Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and asked him, We aren't blind too, are we? Jesus said, If you were blind, you wouldn't have sinned. But now that you say we sin, or we see, your sin remains. Then he goes directly into this, truly I tell you, 
Anyone who doesn't enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs over some other way is a thief and a robber. So Jesus is once again pinning, no pun intended, pinning the, the, on the scribes and the Pharisees a truth that he wanted them to understand. He, he's not using thieves and robbers merely as a reflection of their culture, although being an agrarian culture, this was a reality that they had to deal with. This is a metaphor for the people that the other people were having to listen to. He goes on to say that, that anybody who came before me that's not teaching the way that I'm teaching, that's not telling the truth about me, these are the guys who are the thieves and the robbers. So what's up with all this sheep pen stuff anyway? What was going on with the sheep pen? Because you have the pen, you have thieves and robbers, you have the shepherd, you have the gatekeeper. What in the world is all this about? Well, in this era, there were several types of sheep pens. Some would have been attached to a house. So one of the walls of the house would have formed one of the walls of the sheep pen, and then you would have had other walls uh, or fence-like structure, usually stone with some kind of fence, uh, not fencing, but limbs or thorns or something like that on top that would prevent wild animals from getting in or the sheep from hopping over. And it would make it perilous for a thief to try to come in. A gate would be somewhere on there for the sheep to come in and out. Some houses actually brought the sheep in at night, and they would just put them in the living room because that was the only thing that they could afford. A different type of pen was what I will call a communal pen. That's not the actual name. I'm going to call it that because it was away from the town. So the sheep would go out into pasture. They would be in the pasture. The shepherds would go with them. They would stay away from the town. They would feed them. They would pasture them. They would bring them back when it was time to eat one of them. So sometimes multiple flocks would graze together in the pastures. They didn't bring them back every night. It wasn't like they brought them home and then, you know, put them up and then took them back out the next day every time. And so sometimes they would have a pen that was built that was used by more than one shepherd, and it would protect more than one flock. And so the shepherds would come and go with their flocks, and there was a gatekeeper. This guy was usually hired by the town or hired by all the people who owned the flocks, and he would manage the system. So these shepherds would come, they would bring all their sheep in, then the gatekeeper would close the gate. Now, Jesus is making a separate point here that's, that I'm going to leave for uh, whoever preaches on Jesus being the shepherd, but we have to mention it because it's in this particular passage. Notice how he describes what's going on here. The shepherd brings in his sheep, they know his voice, he calls them by name. Then when he comes out, his sheep follow him. Now, if you've ever been in this situation, you've ever witnessed this kind of thing, the sheep respond to their shepherd. So even if there's 100 sheep in this pen and there's 10 shepherds or there's five shepherds, when the gatekeeper opens the gate and shepherd Isaac begins to take his flock out and he calls Shorty and Lucky and Blackie and Spotty and he calls his sheep by name, his sheep follow him out. The rest of the sheep stay. Why? Because their shepherd hasn't said anything. Their shepherd's not going anywhere. When their shepherd leaves, they'll follow him. Then it says, he goes out in front of him, or in front of them, and they recognize his voice and they follow him. They will not follow the voice of the stranger. So every sheep knew their own shepherd, and every sheep followed their own shepherd. So this is the context for what Jesus is saying here. The problem was that the Pharisees, the religious leaders, did not understand him. Now, we're, we're accustomed to this by now, right? I mean, this, is, this happens all the time. When Jesus is giving parables, when Jesus is teaching pretty straightforward, somebody somewhere doesn't understand something. So he comes, he gives this parable, he's showing them what's going on, and they still don't get it. So Jesus comes back and very plainly says, I am the gate. Don't change the slide yet, because I have to go back and say something. One of the things that the Pharisees and the scribes didn't understand was that they were the thieves and the robbers. Now, if you go back into the Old Testament, there's a verse in Isaiah chapter 56, verse 11. There's a passage in Ezekiel chapter 34, uh, verses 1 to 10. We're going to read on screen Jeremiah 23, 1 and 2, because Jesus is actually referring to Old Testament truths as he's trying to explain to the Pharisees how God looks at them. In Jeremiah 23, 1, he says, Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. This is the Lord's declaration. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says about the shepherds who tend to my people. 
You have scattered my flock, banished them, and have not attended to them. I am about to attend to you because of your evil acts. This is the Lord's declaration. So the Pharisees would have understood at some point that what Jesus was saying to them was, you are just like the shepherds that my father did not like back in the Old Testament. You are the one that led the sheep astray because that's what you're doing now. You are the one that scattered the flock because that's what you're doing now. You are the ones that did not teach them the truth because that's what you're doing now. And so in this this context that Jesus is giving us, he's letting the Pharisees know you guys are the problem. The sheep aren't the problem. These fake shepherds, you guys are the problem. So then Jesus says, I am the gate. This is one of the the seven I am statements that are in the Gospel of John, where Jesus takes an opportunity to kind of sideways yet straightforward connect himself to the Father. Now, if you have your Bible and you want to turn back to Exodus chapter 3, this is the significance of those I am statements. All the way back, if you've ever seen the Ten Commandments, this part's going to be familiar to you. All the way back in Exodus chapter 3 is Moses and the burning bush. So Moses is out, guess what, tending the flocks, and he notices something that he's never seen before. There's a bush on fire. It's burning, it's burning, it's burning, but it's not burning up. And so he goes over to see what's going on, and he finds God in the middle of the bush. And in chapter 3 of Exodus, verse 5, do not come closer, he said, remove the sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he continued, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. If you ever heard that old saying, there's not a demon behind every bush, when this particular instance, God was actually in the bush, and he stayed there, and he had an entire conversation with Moses. Moses, of course, had to put up some kind of a defense because he didn't know what was going on. So in verse 11, he says, what, who, me? I'm going to go talk to Pharaoh. I'm the guy that you're, you're calling for this mission. Then Moses, in verse 13, asks God, if I go to the Israelites and say to them, so he wasn't, he knew, he knew his people, folks. He knew they weren't likely to get all roused up and, and, you know, let's follow Moses. So if I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent to me, and they say, what's his name? What should I say to them? And God replied to Moses, I am who I am, Hebrew Yahweh. This is what you're to say to the Israelites. I am has sent you. So when Jesus is using these I am statements, he is connecting himself to the the specific, unusual name of God that God used for himself all the way back in Exodus chapter 3. Now, here's the thing. Jesus did this more than once. He connected himself to God all through, especially the Gospel of John. John brings this out over and over again. In John chapter 6, when Jesus is walking on the water, we remember this story. It's the middle of the night. The disciples are scared to death. They all think they're going to die. They look out. Jesus is walking on the water. And he says, in our English translations, usually say something like this, don't be afraid, it's me. Don't be afraid, it's me. But the actual translation goes something like this. Don't be afraid, the I am is with you. This is a totally different thing than Jesus just saying, hey, guys, it's me. He says, the I am is with you. So they brought him into the boat and everything was cool. But there were other times that Jesus aligned himself with the the Father in the same way, and it didn't turn out so cool. In John chapter 7, Jesus says, I know him, the Father, because I'm from him. He sent me. And the response of the crowd was to try and seize him so that they could do something nefarious with him. In John chapter 8, Jesus says this, before Abraham was, I am. I mean, this is not even like a sideways reference. This is not even like metaphorical. He says, before Abraham was, I am. Do you think they understood it? The Bible says that they picked up stones and were attempting to stone him to death. They knew exactly what he was saying. At the end of chapter 10, beyond where we'll go today, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. Again, they picked up stones to try to stone him to death. In one of these situations, it's recorded Jesus went and hid. That's not always a bad strategy. Sometimes that's the right thing to do if Jesus himself actually did it. So anytime Jesus claimed oneness with the Father, there were always kinds of problems. And this is exactly the kind of thing that he was doing with these statements. If you'll remember, 
when Jesus was finally betrayed to the religious authorities, the complaint that they had, the only thing they ever could come up with to tell the Romans to put him to death was this. He's making himself equal with God, and that's a violation of our law. They knew in the end who it was that Jesus was claiming to be. So he says, I am the gate. Well, there's at least one more type of sheep pen that was common back in those days. And I'll let Grant Osborne, who wrote a commentary on John, explain it. He says this, At night in the field where the sheep grazed, shepherds would sometimes make makeshift pens using rocks with thorns on top of them to keep the sheep in and the wild animals out. The shepherd would then sleep across the opening, becoming, in effect, the gate for the sheep. So when Jesus says, I am the gate for the sheep, I'm saying he's using a literal metaphor. Because the shepherd often became the literal gate for the sheep when there was just a makeshift pen. And so Jesus is saying, I am the gate. I am the one through whom you must come in order to be protected. I am the one through whom you must go in order to find pasture. I am the one in whom you must trust in order to find security. Jesus is saying to them, I am the gate. And this is why he continues later on to say, if somebody comes in some other way, they're not the gate. I'm the gate. I am the one who is laying down his life for the sheep. So Jesus is the true gate, the true shepherd, the one who's known by his sheep, the only way to the kingdom, the only way to pasture. He is leading his sheep, and this harkens us back to Psalm 23, where he takes us out into green pastures and still waters. So there's a third thing, and Pastor Derek references this a lot. In fact, I went back to the first sermon in this series, and one of the first things you said was, you talk talking about the abundant life. Jesus has come, that we might have life and might have it more abundantly. We really need to dive down into this a little bit, because this is really messed up. Uh, we live in an era where there's a lot of messed up interpretations about this. So notice that Jesus says, I'm come that they might have a life. More than 40 times in John's gospel, he mentions life. Verses like this, John 1, 4, in him was life, and this life was the light of men. John 3, 16, whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. John 3.36, the one who believes in the Son has eternal life, but the one who rejects the Son will not see life. John 5.21, and just as the Father raises the dead and gives him life, so the Son gives life to who he wants. John 6.35, I'm the bread of life. John 6.63, the Spirit is the one who gives life. John 8.12, I I am the light of the world. Anyone who who doesn't want to walk in darkness will have the light of life. More than 40 more times, John mentions life. But notice what he says. He does not say you'll have life and an abundance. He says you will have life and you will have it in abundance. So to think about life, let's go back. Let's go all the way back to Eden. Let's go all the way back to Eden where God gave life to humanity. If you remember the story, the Bible says God created the heavens, the earth, he created the stars, created everything, all the animals running around. Then the Bible says he created man out of the dust of the ground. I don't know what that looked like. I mean, I'm thinking of Mr. Bill or, you know, Wallace from Wallace and Gromit. I don't know what that looked like. You just got God forming something out of the dirt. And he didn't form Adam alive. He formed Adam. And Adam's just there. He's not dead. He's inanimate. There's nothing there. Then the Bible says God breathes into his nostrils the breath of life, and Adam becomes then a living being. He becomes a living soul in some translations. You say, well, what kind of life did he have? Well, he had a good life. He got a wife out of his side. That's a pretty good deal, I think. So that was pretty good. But Adam and Eve had the only kind of life that God would give them. They had the kind of life that they were in perfect fellowship with each other. They were in perfect fellowship with creation. They were in perfect fellowship with all of the animals. And they were in perfect fellowship with God who would come down in the breezy part of the day and have fellowship with them. They had the kind of life that God created so that they could have fellowship with him. That's the kind of life that God created that Adam and Eve enjoyed until they sinned. Then when they sinned, the light went out, the life went out. God told them, in the day that you sin, you will die. We know they didn't physically die, but something about them died. Their ability to have unencumbered fellowship with God was cut off. They died in that sense. There was something about their inner being. There was something about their spirituality that died on the vine in that moment 
where they could no longer fellowship with God. And that's the kind of death that was passed on every person who came along after them. See, God had given them every single thing they needed in the garden, but at one point they traded this blessing. They thought somehow that God was holding out on them. What happened? A thief came in some other way and destroyed the life that God had given to them. So now we're talking about life. Jesus comes along and says, I'm life. I can give life. I'm the water of life. I'm the bread of life. I am the gate. And if you'll come in through me, you'll have pasture. If you'll come in through me, you'll be blessed. If you'll come in through me, you will have life. You say, well, I'm already alive. I'm sitting here today. But you don't have that life because you're sitting here today. You only have that life if you come through Jesus Christ. You can only come boldly into the presence of the Father if you have life. See, the Bible never says you're going to get eternal life when you die. Because eternal life is not a quantity of life. It is a quality of life. It's a kind of life. It's not, it's not an extension of life. It's the kind of life that, that allows us to be back in a relationship, back into fellowship with God Almighty Himself. That's the reason you can come boldly into the throne of grace like a toddler breaking into a dinner party with no care about what's going on because he needs to talk to daddy about something. It's why through faith we can enter into the promises of God. It's why Satan wants to cast doubt into our lives because he knows if he brings doubt into our lives, he can destroy the abundance of faith. So it's not that it's not that it's not about things. This is the thing, it's not that God gives us life and an abundance. So you can you can have the abundant life whether you drive a Peugeot or whether you drive a Lambo. You can have the abundant life whether you work at the hardware store or whether you're the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. You can have the abundant life whether you live on the edge of town or whether you live downtown. It simply does not matter. The, the things aren't the thing. Jesus says in Luke 12, 15, that your life does not consist in the abundance of things that you possess. He offers instead life in itself and abundance, not things that come alongside. So this is the thing I think that we have to, have to deal with. <clears throat> Jesus said in John chapter 17, verse 1 through 3, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh so that he can give eternal life to everyone that you've given him, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and the one you sent, Jesus Christ. This is eternal life. It's knowing God. It's being in that relationship with him. In John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, Jesus has stopped off at the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, who he had conveniently risen from the dead a little while before. This is on his way to Jerusalem, where he's eventually going to be betrayed and crucified. He stops by their house. He's having a conversation with Martha, who is busy, busy, busy. And Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? So Jesus is posting this contrast right here. It's not about this physical living and breathing. Some of you will never know. Some of you will struggle to know the life that God wants you until you're dead. When he offers it to you now. He offers to you the kind of life that you, can, that you will enjoy in eternity. He offers it to you right now. And many of us are so weighed down by the cares of the day and the cares of the world, and we allow the thief. We don't just allow the thief to come in. We open the freaking gate for him. We move the briars off the wall so he can climb over and destroy the abundance that God wants to give us. And then we wonder what's going on. So the, the Greek word that's used here, I think this is the next slide, yes, para, uh, paraton or parason or something, I don't know, I'm terrible at Greek. It is parason, that is paraton. Uh, it means abundance, superfluous, more than is really necessary. It means to have a full abundance. Now, don't, don't raise your hand. <laughs> but if you're a believer, if you know Christ, I mean, just kind of inwardly think about this question. Is this the kind of life you're experiencing in Jesus right now? 
because this is the, this is the life that he came to give us. This is what he said. This, I mean, like right clearly in his word. I'm come that they, they my sheep, can have life and have it in abundance. Is this the kind of life that you're experiencing right now? If it's not, you need to ask yourself how, the, how a thief has gotten in and what that thief has done. Because this is what Jesus is offering. J.D. Otis Roberts in his book, uh, The Prophethood of Black Believers, writes this, and this is about what happens when a bunch of believers that are experiencing this get together. It's called the church. And he says, the church that Jesus founded is an extension of the incarnation. The church is the means by which that revelation is manifest in community and throughout history. It is through the church's mission and ministry that God's will is to be done on earth. And when Jesus says, you're salt and light, when Jesus says that we are salt and light, let me ask you this question. Do people look at my life on the whole? Do people look at your life on the whole and think, man, I, w- I wish I could have that. I wish I could have that peace. I wish I could have that joy. I wish I could have that confidence that God's going to hear my prayers. I wish I could have that confidence that God loves me and knows me and that my, my future is eternally secure. I wish I could. Do, do they see that in our lives? Because life is witnessed by other people. Life is seen by others. It's not merely that I'm living it out, dredging it day to day to day. It's that God promises this and other people can see it and we can witness to them. See, the thief can't steal your life because you're eternally belonging to the shepherd. The thief can't kill you because you have life, but the thief can't destroy the abundance that God has promised. A number of years ago, God blessed me to be able to go to Kenya, and I had no idea what I was getting into. I said, you're going to go to Kenya. It's going to be a two-week mission trip, and you're going to get to preach in churches. And I'm like, killer. So I pack up every preacher uniform I owned, had two gigantic suitcases. Uh, It was only the second time I think I'd ever been out of the country. Flew all the way to Nairobi. I had no idea what we were doing. We get on a bus the second day or something like that and drive like 45 miles out, and we're like where the zebras and the lions, not the lions, but the uh, monkeys and the gazelles, and it's it's half National Geographic just on the way to where we're going. We get there, and we unload into the Motel 1 parking lot, and um, there's a mosquito net over the bed, which I was not anticipating in the least, and had a big hole in it, which like wasn't great. And uh, so the first day when we checked in, they assigned us a can of bug spray uh, because there was a gap that big under the door leading right to the outside where all of those bugs that'll kill you lived. And so we got to uh, spray underneath the door every night and spray the windowsills every night. Well, during the day, we would go out. So I put on my preacher uniform the first day, go out in a van way out. I'm like, just forever in a day. Get out and we meet up with these evangelists who are all tribal Maasai. So these are guys, literally, that you might see on National Geographic. And they're all dressed and ready. And so we begin to walk, and we... So then I find out what we're doing. And we're walking from homestead to homestead. Forget this preaching in a church business. We're walking from homestead to homestead, and they're anywhere from 25 to 45 minutes apart. So I'm out there in my preacher uniform, my hard soul shoes, you know, suffering for Jesus. I'm suffering because I'm a moron is the reason I'm suffering. But I'm out there trudging around. So these, I begin to talk to these Maasai evangelists. I couldn't speak Swahili, but all these guys that would have normally been looked down on could all speak English. So we're having a conversation because they knew my language, not because I knew theirs. And so we began to talk, and we would walk. And it was from those guys that I learned about worship. It's from those guys what I that I learned what it meant to have a song in your heart. Now, I'm not going to tell the whole story, but I'm telling this part for this reason. I had taken two suitcases full of clothes. They wore one suit all week long. They went home on the weekend and washed it probably in the river or in a watering hole. Came back the next week, wore the same clothes all week long. And I was there as the professional Christian come from the United States on an airplane to preach the gospel. Wound up talking to families outside of their chicken pens. 
that was my preaching the gospel. I wasn't in churches, wasn't mine pulpits, wasn't with microphones, none of that kind of stuff that I envisioned because I was stupid. And God put me with a bunch of guys that just loved him, probably could have preached circles around me if they'd have been given the chance to because they knew him in a way I didn't. And they had nothing. They did live in huts. They did live in clay homes with a fireplace that burned most of the time. Lunch was in a tin shed, corrugated metal. First time I'd ever seen a bicycle rim used for a TV antenna and barbed wire used for the cable that ran down to the television set. These folks didn't have stuff, but they had Jesus. And they had him in a way that I didn't. So when Jesus says, I am the gate, think about this. Gates are primarily used for two things security and transit, to let things in and out and to protect what's inside of the fence. So do you know Jesus? Because you can, you, know, you can try to come through the gate. You can try to come over the wall like a thief or a robber. He's already got you pegged there. And you can try to come to the gate arrogant and boastful and self-reliance, telling God how awesome you are and how he ought to let you into his kingdom. And you will find the gate locked up tight to which you and your army will never be able to open. But if you're humble before God and you're repentant before him and you know that your life is messed up and you come to him bruised and you come to him broken and you come to him with your life in shambles, then you will find a gate that is open that no man can close. And inside that gate, you'll find a shepherd who will pick you up and tend your wounds and who will love you. I can ask you for just a moment to bow your heads, close your eyes. If you're not comfortable with that, if that makes you feel weird in any way, then just pick a spot on the floor, take a look at that. Just It's, it's kind of a moment where people need to feel confident that they're not being watched. That's the whole thing. And I do want to ask you in this moment, do you have the kind of life that Jesus offers, this, this abundant life? Do you have that life that he gives that you can only get from him. Not your birth life, not the life that came from your mom, but life in Christ. Do you have that? Because he offers it to you. When he says, I am the gate, he says, if anyone will come in through me, they can go in and out and find pasture. So I want to ask you, this morning, have you come through the gate? Do you know Jesus? Now, we're not going to have one of those invitation times where everybody stands up and people start, you know, coming forward and that kind of thing, but I do want to ask in the, mo- in the moment, if you need to ask Christ to save you, that's actually a word used in this passage. If you come in through the gate, you'll be saved to change your life to forgive your sins, to give you this kind of life that he's talking about here. If that's something that needs to happen in your life, you can actually pray in your own heart right now, and God will hear you. There's another verse in the Bible that says, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's not even a maybe so or a hope so. God's promised to hear that very specific kind of prayer. So if you will call on him right now and confess how badly you need him and that you're apart from him and that you can't do anything about it. You can't save yourself. You can't turn yourself into the sheep inside the pen. But you know that he can and you're coming to him as the gate. And you truly believe his word. He'll save you. I'm going to pray to close this part of the service. Pastor Derek is going to come. And there's going to be a prayer time for some of our new family group leaders. When that's over with, he's going to call our prayer team up. And if in this part of the service you've just prayed to receive Christ, or if you've still got some questions about it and you really want to talk to somebody who, who can you know, hear you out, when the prayer team is called up at the end of the service, everybody will be dismissed. There will be a bunch of moving around. I want to encourage you to come to one of them and just say, hey, I, I, you know, I prayed during that prayer time, and you know, I think, God's changing me or has changed me, and I just want to make sure I know what's going on here. 
or if you've got some questions and you just got, want to talk to somebody further, that'll be a good time to take advantage of that. Our pastors will be around. You can talk to them if you want to. But I'm going to pray to close this part of the service. Pastor Derek's going to come up. Father, we thank you for the day, for the time, for your word, for these that have just come to know you, and for others that are still seeking. We ask that you would be real in this moment to them. Give them faith to be saved in Jesus' name.